welcome, welcome everybody to my YouTube Shakuhachi channel. <laughs> and welcome to you, Hans Araki. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. Hans Araki has various names, Araki Kodo 6, <laughs> <laughs> Hans Araki Campbell as well. Yeah. And uh, well, we might get a few explanations from now on. It's great you're here. And I'm also very happy because uh, the two of us have a few things in common. Yes. We both half American, half Japanese. Mm -hmm. And we both are quasi players. Yeah. After that, it might stop the common. <laughs> <laughs> My family in Japan might have a great history and things like that, but we don't have a great shakuhachi history. Right. But your family certainly does. Yeah. I mean, going back, well, five generations within my bloodline and then. So bloodline wise, that is from Araki Kodo the second. Yes. Okay. So the, the first handover was not, uh, like for, from father to son. Right. Uh, Kodo one was, uh, Kodo Toyoda hmm. and he was my great, great grandfather's teacher and uh, gave him the name Kodo. So my great, great grand Kodo too was Hanzaburo, which is, that's who I was named after. Mm -hmm. uh, coincidentally became, uh, I have two brothers and uh, I was the only Shakuhashi player right. of, of my siblings. I have a sister as well, but um, yeah, it was a uh, just by coincidence. coincidence. <laughs> you got the Hansa Buro and you became the Shakuhachi player. Maybe yeah. it's kind of in the name. And <laughs> yeah, it could be. <laughs> so, um, the Araki lineage, you know, it's very often uh, written that it's the oldest and the most important, you know, uh, legacy connected to Kurosawa Kinko, the kind of the father of Kinko Ryu. Mm. Can you? explain that connection you know how how is it connected because you know if you're not a kinko expert then you get a little bit confused by the various lineages right so the the connection would be through uh kinko three hmm. um so kurosawa kinko one two and then three and a contemporary okay. of my uh, great great grandfather was uh, Yoshida Icho, mm -hmm. and so they were kind of contemporaries at the same time. But you know, uh, Yoshida was more of a direct student of Kurosawa three, and uh, but they both, you know, were playing at the same time and developing the music, you know, uh, as. We've all been sort of discussing lately this the the development of shakuhachi music from the Edo period through to the Meiji Restoration. So, um, yeah, I'd say that would be the the link would be uh, Kinko three. Okay, so there's the link to Kinko three, and and then from then on, it became kind of a a grouping. Group. Yeah. And can um, you the, describe if there's any like playing differences between like <clears throat> the Kodos and Chiku Meisha, Chiku Yusha? Yeah. And, yeah. The easiest thing is to, I'm glad I had this right here, uh, it's probably the vibrato, right. which we do this way. We move the instrument. And same with the, any of the uh, techniques like tsukiyuri or yuri or muraiki, mm -hmm. move this rather than this. So I think that's probably the like the most obvious and sort of overt difference is, mm. you know, we do the vibrato by shaking the instrument. Right. Interesting. Mm. You didn't notice that. Yeah, well, it's subtle because it still moves by doing this. 
your head still <laughs> still moves. Yeah. Yeah, and and the vice versa. When you move your head, it moves as well. Obviously. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Interesting. So, but so there are these kind of little aesthetically aesthetic differences, but mm-hmm. basically, it's kinko new all of them. Yeah. The, the all of the mechanics are the same. All of the I, I guess the other, as I've grown to discover more, and and not from my own ear, but actually discussing with with other uh, instructors, is that we tend to medi notes lower mm-hmm. and nayashi lower. Okay. So like, it's a. <laughs> You know, it's a, it's, uh, I guess, more of a full. The whole note. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 All right. Okay. So little differences like that, you could, as a Kiko expert, certainly hear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which, right. I'm not. <laughs> Great. Um, then I would actually really like to um, begin with your story, your personal kind of story. Like, I mean, so reading around, I could uh, understand that you started playing Sarkwati when you were 17? Yes. Yeah, I, a relatively late start compared to my father. So, yeah. But yeah. Uh, it was um, the, the first time I played the instrument was exactly like this just now. Like he handed it to me mm-hmm. and... I was able to make that sound and so there were a lot of little things that did come to me naturally whether or not it's genetic or <laughs> or what but we um Some like my than others. Yeah. right my embouchure uh he never had to work with me on that he never had to work with me on breathing that was all kind of in- instinctive like the the that style of breathing so much so that um, that that was the hardest part for me to teach for years because it was something that I never had to learn and so it's hard to impart something that came to you sort of innately Mm -hmm. Um, like the the the, you hear it a lot like you have to breathe from down here and I never could understand that when I was younger you know because (laughs) my lungs are here but you know, so that this the the idea of more breath control coming from your diaphragm, that sort of thing, it was never never anything that we discussed. So we leapt in immediately to playing music, and uh, that yeah, that was it was uh, from my first lesson was in April of 1988, mm-hmm. and I made my debut in Shimonoseki in August that year. <laughs> amazing <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah oh. i wish i had yet another name he named me baikyoku yes oh. it was my grandfather's professional name before he was kodo so i became he always called me baikyoku f- five even though i think there was another baikyoku one of my grandfather's students Long story. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yet, yet another name to confuse everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What did you play at that concert? I played Etendaku. Etendaku. Okay. Yeah. And Kumoi Jushi and uh, Sanya Tsukakakahi. And that is four months after you started playing. Yeah. Well. You must be from another planet. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's great. Well, so so tell me what happened then. But was that? Did you play anything else before that? No, I I played piano when I was eight, um, but I my teacher was um, she was strict, but. Uh, like rigid, I would say, actually, she, I, I never could learn to read Western staff notation, and I still can't. 
and I was faking it at that time. And she, uh, we were we were playing Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, mm -hmm. and I was playing away just from memory because I couldn't read the page, and I was just sort of randomly, I turned the page at some point, and she she stopped me and she said, "Point on the page where you are," and I guessed and. She got very upset and she left and uh, didn't come back. So I quit. You know, I didn't. I yeah. this wasn't what I wanted to do. I did. You know, I had no interest in learning how to read music. And but I ask you then: Is it easy for you to remember uh, Shakuhachi music? Yes and no. It's it's not as easy as it used to be. <laughs> Now that I, you know, as I get older, I wonder how I used to remember these 36 pieces, just no problem. Now I, I have to review constantly, otherwise they, I forget. So, but yeah, I mean, you know, I have a decent recall for, for melody and right. that's right. Well, yet another special other planet <laughs> <laughs> Okay, great. So, so apart from that piano uh, time, then Shabbat was the first instrument you picked up. Yeah, yeah, nothing in that period between when I was eight and 17. And um, so how did your Shabbat education, how did that form? So you started out learning from your father. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and with one exception, he and I, I mean, we played together every day for four years. Um, so there was my lesson time and then my practice time. And those were separate. So, I, you know, it was usually about six hours every day. Uh, which also that helps explain why I was able to debut four months after. I mean, it, it started immediately, but that first lesson was probably two hours, and um, and then I had to practice and lessons and practice and lessons and practice. So um, you you might think it explains, <laughs> <laughs> but still, yes. I mean, obviously, it's more investment than most people do yeah so, what's been very interesting to me though over this past while is that uh he never once ever spoke to me about any of the history any and even barely talked about my ancestors most i mean if he talked about koto three it was a usually a funny story, nothing ever, you know, very serious. And so, you know, lately I've, you know, I've been reading, I read a, an essay of yours. Um, I read uh, an essay from Max Deeg. Mm -hmm. That was, it, it's been just so fascinating to, to go back and, and see more history because he never spoke of this. And so I, I, I got a copy of his master's thesis from Wesleyan. Mm -hmm. that he wrote in 1971 and a, because it's a photocopy I've been retyping it you know so I can have a digital copy of it and uh you know the, there's more in there than he ever talked to me so did you ever ask him what no I, I mostly I you know I had so much material I, I was trying to learn that we barely I mean I can understand why he didn't speak to me more about it but uh because we were playing so much and you know I, it was interesting hearing f not just from these essays i've been reading but from other people that most instructors start with sun kyoku music before you ever get to hong kyoku i was the exact opposite we started with hong kyoku and then pretty quickly introduced sun kyoku and then we did both at the same time. So after those four years, what happened then? Where you played so intensively with your father? Yeah, it. I regret it now. I, 
was so 21 uh yeah 21 i would have almost just before i turned 22 uh was when i left japan and you know it was hmm? was, was this in japan yeah yeah i moved to japan so we went to japan in in august of that year for where i debuted <clears throat> we came back for a couple months and then moved um that same year okay so that's when your father also moved back to japan yes. yeah because we that were. obviously reverberated into the chocolate society or kind of thing the world that Kodo five now have moved back to japan yeah yeah oh, nice. so you were with him then okay yeah from from 88 to 90 92 almost hmm. yeah just just december i think i left december 25th or something <laughs> right around there to go back to the states but i you know you know japan at that time it was very different you know the bubble economy and everyone's money crazy and it's so busy and it's a very different place for me anyway and i didn't have any friends my own age all of my friends were in the shakuhachi world and they were at least at least 10 years older usually more so i i burnt out i was exhausted and um had never done it anything before you know other than just a job that that required that much focus and that much attention and that much time um looking back i wish i had just taken a vacation just taken a break um but yeah i came back to the states and i played for a while uh, i played shagrachi i mean i still played throughout but i tried teaching and performing and uh, teaching was difficult um, a lot more people were more interested in sort of spiritual guidance than they were in learning music and so I, I couldn't give them what they wanted and I was a little disillusioned <laughs> so take, going back to your time in Japan like in my case I'm very often asked if I experienced kind of uh, reluctance or even discrimination because I'm a woman, and mm. I always say that it was it was a bigger issue that I wasn't hundred percent Japanese. How was that for you? Same. I would say it's the exact same. It's you know the, the hardest part in in speaking a second language is you know, expressing real emotion and expressing a, a real deeper meaning and also understanding those things. And so when you're not Japanese, 100% Japanese, and, and I tell people this and it's true that even my dad um, was not considered really Japanese because he left Japan for, he was gone for 20 years. So people thought, Oh yeah, his Japanese is kind of funny now because he's he's been living in America, even though he never really got very good English <laughs> in all the time he was here. Um, but he, uh, yeah, he 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 faced this a, a similar kind of discrimination in that like if you disagreed with someone, it was less because you didn't see eye to eye and more so because you weren't Japanese and that it's, it's, it, it, it's not, it's a subtle kind of discrimination, but it's still after a while, it builds and builds and builds to become fairly frustrating, you know? Yes, I can, I can relate to that. <laughs> yeah. You dismissed out of hand for, before you can even really try to express a point or something, you know? And I was wondering, um, now that you also mentioned your father, um, so I, w I actually wanted to ask you how he was received when he went back to Japan after all these years. 
Was he taken seriously? Could he find jobs? Now I can understand he spent quite some time with you as well, but was he yeah. able to kind of enter that quite rigid Hogaku world again? <laughs> he was. It, it, it's. I don't really understand it. I have theories as to why it happened this way, but people were very, very uh, excited for him to come back and encouraging. You know, he, he went back several times over my lifetime uh, and people would always urge him to come back and take over Kodokai and all of this sort of thing. And then he... Um, when he was there, suddenly now people were threatened that, you know, the people he, he had left in charge of Kodokai now didn't want to give up their position and, you know, maybe resented him being there. At least that's how it seemed. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it's a little confusing, you know, of course, to, to say why why were they so eager to have him come back only to sort of shun him once he did get there you know and then you think about the particular type of politeness that happens in Japanese language where of course you'll say that you'll say that you want this person to come back but you don't really think that they're going to do it because they've been gone for 20 years and then they actually come back and there's a bit of resentment you know so it was a struggle so he but he did you know he he did take over Kotokai and and he it was great for him to have me there because that meant all of the recitals and beginning students and all that I could take all of that and he could focus more on other things and so when I left it was he never said anything to me but I don't think it was I don't think he was very happy <laughs> Did you leave at the same time or did you leave separate times? From Japan? Mm -hmm. No, I left. So I left in 92 and then um, he came back in 2011. Okay, so he stayed quite quite a while. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's, that is a quite a long time that he then yeah. stayed. How were, how was you, how was the reception of you there i mean you you already mentioned some things but now how was it when you had that event where you became the kodo six you know how was the how were the other people thinking you know like you, you can't say how they were thinking but how how did it feel the this whole history is i i absolutely don't mind talking about it but it, you know it's a little painful only because I actually didn't know so he never told me that he named me Kodo 6 it happened I found out from someone else um, okay. that this ceremony happened and it was it was at a celebration for Kodo 2 and that my my dad took the name Chikuo and became Chikuo 2 and named me Kodo Six, and never told me. So it, there was no fanfare, there was no celebration, there was no, I didn't know. Okay, so at the ceremony you didn't? I wasn't there. Oh, you weren't even there? No. Okay. Even though I was in Japan every year since, I went back in 90, 92, 93, 94, 95, and then I, I took a break from going to Japan until 99, and then I was there every year, and so this this was in 2009, and I was there in November, and I can't remember when the ceremony was, but he just he never told me. And there's sort of a long story there, where he, my dad had started to have real uh, trouble. Uh, with some mental health issues that were 
Okay. Yeah, they were, they were, uh, he had moved from Tokyo up to Iwateken, up to Tono, mm -hmm. and was living in this beautiful farmhouse. It was very quiet, and he has always had a, a difficulty sleeping. And um, he moved from Tono back to Tokyo because he was te teaching still every month, and he would take this incredible trip down all the way from Tono, all the way down to Kyushu and back every month. So he moved back to, to Tokyo and it was loud and chaotic and he wasn't sleeping for oftentimes five, six days with no sleep. And he just kind of had a, a breakdown. Okay. So it, it was around that time that, that he decided to become Chikuo and he just never thought to tell me <laughs> or maybe he thought he told me or um yeah now that you did became become the Kodo 6 I mean how's your relationship with the Kodokai are you now the head of Kodokai technically yeah. yes but I've, I've not really spoken to many people yet um, my plan was to meet with everyone this year, but uh, my Japan trip was canceled, obviously. So, uh, yeah, as I started playing again more um, over this past few years and wanting to maybe get back to the Shakuhachi community a bit more. Um, I, my plan was to meet up with Kodokai and establish just a relationship. I don't need, I don't need to be, I can be a figurehead or anything that they need me to be. I, it's, it's important to me, but it's not my position. Isn't that important? You know? Okay. So, yeah, I didn't, uh, I've spoken to a few people and, um, but yeah, well, it remains to be seen. Hopefully next year. <laughs> you have a rooster outside. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, sorry. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we live on a farm here in Maine, so. Oh, nice. And he grows all day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> They actually do. It doesn't have to be morning, so no. <laughs> so, um, so in a way, I mean, being part of at least the international Shakuhachi community, um, so you weren't present. Uh, and then now you've started to enter and, and make your presence here, which is great, you know. Um, so what happened in between? In between, I, I started playing Irish music and um, which was, has, it's been wonderful. And I really love the music and I, I play Irish flute, which is different from silver flute. It's, you know, there's no keys. So it's similar to Shakuhachi. And then I also play the whistle, which is played this way, but with a mouthpiece. Um, and I sing so and the thing that I always enjoyed about Japanese music was playing ensemble music I love Sankyoku and I've never really enjoyed playing solo music so um, over this past 20 years longer now uh, playing Irish music has been so great because it's always ensemble you know and and I loved it so I, I still would play shakuhachi concerts a few times a year um, mostly at for special events for like the Seattle Art Museum and the Portland Japanese Gardens would have me play several times a year 
but it was really just that it was local and I didn't have any recordings out or anything like that so I mostly played Irish music and what made that shift so I mean are you still playing Irish music yeah some um, when I was still in Japan so my, my mother is Irish um, and my my dad when he was in the States was <clears throat> in the well I should say when he first came to the States he was in the ethnomusicology world and um, so there was a lot of different world music in the house where when I grew up um, a lot of Indonesian music a lot of Indian music and a lot of Irish music and um, when I was living in Japan and studying with my father and playing shakuhachi every day I started to just play Irish songs on the shakuhachi just for fun you know and uh, when I came back to the States I bought a, a penny whistle and sort of just almost as a a fun idea some friends of mine from high school started a band for a St. Patrick's Day party and we learned 40 or 50 songs I can't remember some crazy number of songs that we learned for this party and that band stayed together for three years and we played and I met all these people in the Irish music community in Seattle which is where I grew up and uh, I really fell in love with the music and the songs and and the tunes and uh, people were very welcoming to me so I got very serious about learning Irish music and in recent years you you've started to play more Honkyoku as well and um, and also kind of come come back in into the Shakati world it's an interesting thing being in the States in when I've played Irish music in Ireland it's fine it's no one ever asks how did you get into Irish music it's come up in conversation but it's only in conversation over a long period of time in the in the States people are a little bit different and they are very confused as to why someone who looks like me with a name like Hans Araki plays Irish music and that how did you get into Irish music and I've been in a band with four people none of them are none of us are Irish They're, we're all Americans and people will will this happened on the radio live on the radio how I know I you and you and you play Irish music but how did you start playing Irish music? And the only difference is that they're white and I'm not. And I get it. Again, it's it's a sort of quiet, passive racism that I get very tired of. And meanwhile, as I get older and reminisce and I started playing shakuhachi more more and more and getting back into it and realizing that I have this connection that I don't have to argue with anyone about it they can still say you know well you're only half Japanese or well you've been playing Irish music for 20 years what do you really know about shakuhachi and that's fine that you can say that and I'm still comfortable with myself as a <laughs> as a shakuhachi player and you know but it with Irish music it's been it's been a very long time of people questioning why I do this and you know well you're not you don't look Irish you don't sound Irish you know that it, it gets very very tiring <laughs> after a while and how does it feel now to kind of uh, 
come in and, and be more of a shakuhachi player? It's wonderful because I, I, you know, if I had stepped away from music entirely for 20 years and come back to it, but I've been playing. And so, you know, my embouchure and my breathing and um, my dexterity in my fingers and all that is, has kept growing and progressing. And so I, f I feel a level of comfort that I didn't when I was younger. That's nice that I, I enjoy. I, it makes playing Honkyoku easier. Uh, I mean, just emotionally. Um, it's still difficult, <laughs> you know, for all the technique and everything. It never stops being difficult <laughs> in some ways. Uh, but it's been really nice to, to get back into it. And also because I'm more comfortable with the music and playing music, I have really enjoyed stepping outside of the Araki bubble that I've been in <laughs> for all the all time and realizing, you know, because I'd only ever heard about our family and and very little history outside of that. And even inside of that very little history. There are some people that know more about it than I do. <laughs> my family. Um, so it's it's been really interesting to 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 learn more of the history and and you know the different styles and different you know. I had one uh, of my father's colleagues, uh, Mr. Inoue. Um, who my dad would send me to for lessons maybe once a week for for a while and he's a really amazing player and great shakuhachi maker and um but outside of that all my lessons everything i learned was from my father and um so even though like i'm very happy with that i couldn't ask for a better teacher but um it's been, again, it's just very nice to, to read more about some of the origins of the music and also to dispel a lot of the myth that's out there about the music. And it's, it's just been great. I've been enjoying it very much. It's really been amazing actually just to see you come in and, and take the space that you, you take up so naturally in some way. <laughs> I find, um, and I can totally relate to that bubble thing, you mm. know, which is very, very different from your story, obviously. Uh, but when I started studying with my teacher, Okuda, mm. um, I got so fascinated, so hooked on his sound, his way of playing that I couldn't see here anything else. Yeah. Uh, it was for 10 years. Mm. Uh, it certainly took me, it was a very slow process for me to open up <laughs> to be able to hear, okay, they're not bad, all these out there. <laughs> they're actually great, you know. I, but, you know, also to allow your ears to open. Yeah. So yeah. I, can, I can really relate to it, although it's nothing compared with your. <laughs> and also with the strong education that you got, it's, it's really fascinating to hear about. Yeah. It's been, uh, I'm very happy that. To be playing again as as much as I I have been lately and teaching has been really very enjoyable. Uh, I, that's something I remembered from my time in Japan was as as much as everybody everybody when they play they reach a plateau and you feel like you're just stuck. Mm -hmm. Every time I've been there, it's the process of teaching that that has helped me kind of break through to some other dimension of playing. And I'd say my students have definitely done that for me lately. Oh, that's great. Mm. So, I mean, coming back to your famous family, <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you know about Kodo the first? Very little. And that's what I'm hoping to find, you know, as I 
been digging through everyone's essays, uh, trying to find more. My dad s cites several books in his thesis that I'm hoping to to find more about, and but I, honestly, I don't know. I don't. I know. I know next to nothing, except Toyota Kodo. <laughs> That's yeah. the. It's yeah. not very easy to find, and it probably yeah, you have to dig uh, Japanese language books. Yeah. Like yeah. That. So, um, but there's much more about Kodo the second. Yeah. Yeah. Can you describe him a bit? So I, it was the last tour or the year before when I, I was in Japan. So 2018, I guess, 18, 19, somewhere in there. We did a concert in uh, Minakuchi, which is my, it's Kodotu's, uh birthplace and I didn't know that that again something that nobody ever talked about was that they always just said oh well, he was from Kyoto and then moved to Edo but um, he was actually born in Minakuchi and uh, so it was amazing to be in this in his birth town you know and uh, which is actually in uh, Shigakeng so <laughs> it's not even <laughs> Kyoto at all. Um, but he, he started playing when he was 14. And um, <clears throat> it was, it, what I've seen written was that he was at a, his temple and the shoji screen is closed and heard these, this m music and the, notes from the Shakurachi and he said he, he said to himself there's no way that a, a human being can play a note that long that's impossible you know and so he was from that moment he was hooked and I can't remember now I'm forgetting the name of his first teacher but um, he had to keep going back to get lessons you know and Ask, ask to be taught and they kept on rejecting him saying no 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 and I think it was several weeks of every day you know asking for lessons and finally they taught him and he was promising students so he got sent to uh, Toyota Kodo and that's the beginning and he seemed to have been a, an incredible, you know, creative person, you know, with both making shakuhachi and, and or, you know, also during that the change of the shakuhachi types and things. He was a very key person. Right. Yeah. Um, the the third hole. He changed the size, but then he also, I guess, moved this, the fifth hole, exactly the diameter up. Yeah. So that's another big, a big change. I mean, that's, that's a huge space, you know? Yeah. So those are the biggest ones, the big changes he made to the instrument and then uh, working to arrange Sankyoku pieces for to include Shakuhachi with uh, I can't remember anything anymore <laughs> I'm forgetting everyone's name but with the shamisen player they uh, worked very closely to come up with a lot of arrangements for Shakuhachi and yeah yeah so he's he's certainly some somebody that if you try to get into Shakuhachi history, you bump into him. Many <laughs> yeah. Times. <laughs> yeah. What about Kodo the Third? He's, you know, obviously such a amazing and powerful player, and a brilliant 
Shaka Jamaica himself. Um, he, all the stories I ever heard about him were, you know, he, he's very intense. And uh, both he and my grandfather, unfortunately, they both died very young. He was 56 and my grandfather was 42 or 43 when they died. So, you know, I, I never got to meet my grandfather, which is very sad. Um, and Kodo three, he, he worked very hard and he played very hard. That's what they, they say. He, he liked to drink. He loved the, you know, he would keep his students late after lessons so that they could drink together. <laughs> These are the, the stories that I get told. Um, but he, uh, one of the very few things that my dad told me about him was that we were talking about performing and how, what to do during a concert and, you know, what do you do with the audience? You know, everyone's looking at you. And he, my dad said, you know, easiest thing to do is look just above everyone. You know, don't, you know, just over the top of everyone. So you're still looking out, but don't look at everyone. And and then he said, Kodo the Third would look everyone in the eye. <laughs> he had no fear at all. <laughs> that must have been quite impressive in the audience. Yeah. Like, woo. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And he... I mean, you can hear it in his playing. He's so kind of masculine, you know, and very, very, very forceful. It's almost impossible for me to try to emulate that sound, that um, that kind of presence that he had in his playing. Oh, interesting. And we get to uh, Kodo the Fourth. That's your grandfather. Yeah, and he, like I said, he passed away very young. My dad was five when he died. So he, uh, the story was that he was playing a concert, but he had pneumonia and the doctor told him that he should cancel and he didn't cancel the concert and he played and then he died, <laughs> sadly. But uh, so he never, there, there are some recordings of he and Kodo the Third playing duets, but not, I have the, he, I have the least record of him. Uh, my only photos of him, he's in a tuxedo um, because he also, he loved, he was fascinated by the West and he loved he played concert violin and piano as well. And he, um, yeah, he loved to, evidently, he loved to go to the Tokyo uh, port and watch the foreigners come off the boats. He loved to see that. <laughs> and uh, he was also, he had a student, um, one of his students developed the Okuraro. Oh, oh that's, yes. Um, mm -hmm. And I I wrote to both NHK and to the the hotel Okura. Yep. I have these archives. Because when I was still in Japan, there was a TV show about the, a documentary about the hotel. And... There's one shot, old footage, just like that, going down a dinner table, and my grandfather's there. It's the only film I've ever seen of him, and he's talking to someone, and he laughs. And everyone had always said that that uh, he and I look very much alike, and we play very much alike, especially our hands. Um, my hands are very different from my dad's hands, and my embouchure is very different. But everyone said that I was a lot like my grandfather. And I saw this 
just maybe two seconds of him and it looked exactly like me <laughs> but i haven't been able to find it again but anyway so he he performed on the okuraro uh, as well so he performed on it as well yeah okura yeah that's again part of shakuhachi history right where you were experimenting and of course at that time you know it, the western influence and things like that which is different again from araki the second time where it's more the ensemble when when you think about what kodo 2 was doing at that time was fairly avant-garde you know playing more sankyoku and you know it it's interesting to think of what what that period was like, you know, musically, like. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Great. So, um, and, and your father, um, so that means your father didn't learn shakuhachi from his father. No, he, his, uh, teacher was, um, Kimura, uh, <laughs> I can't remember anything. Kimura, Mr. Kimura. Kimura-san. <laughs> yeah. And um, my dad made his professional debut and he was 12. So he became Kodo the fifth at age 12. Because he, you know, there was no, there needed to be Kodo at the head of Kodokai. And... So that means that at that time, it had become important that it was a bloodline. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, at least to his mother, she was very worried about what their livelihood was going to be because her husband had died so young. And so she kind of pushed him, um, which it's fairly obvious that that's part of the reason why he left Japan and went to the States in 1964 it was just to, to get away. He had been under so much pressure all of, all of his life since he was so small. That's interesting. So there's so much pressure on that boy in some ways. Yeah. So obviously he has to find a way to vent and that's, Oh, getting away and yeah. that's interesting and um, but he kept a connection with Japan mm -hmm. yeah he released uh, an album in 1971 I think uh, through JBC and then um, he went back regularly for concerts and teaching and we we moved well we went to Japan in 1975 supposedly to move it, we didn't end up staying uh, obviously and came back that same year um, and he went back again and maybe like 1980 and then again in more regularly 85 86 87 and then i went with him in 88. was it a problematic thing you know this um, in a way he, he's a head of kodokai which is such an important you know grouping in 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 kinko mm. and, um, but still he kept on coming back to the us and but from here, from the States, it was like he has to go back to Japan for obligations and yeah. you know, maybe he also wanted to, but. I think it, it definitely contributed to the, his difficulty when he did finally move back in 1988 was that he had sort of lost some trust whether or not he was going to stay you know, because he was supposed to move back in 1975. He was supposed to move back again and, or he was supposed to be there in 69 and left again, 75 and left again. So there was some 
resentment there for that. Yeah, and uh, but you said that he he's still well. And... Now you mean? Yeah. Yeah, he doesn't play at all. Not even not one note since uh, since two thousand eleven. But uh, it, when he left, he had just finished a huge recording project of Ikutaryu, Sankyoku, and it uh, it was very involved and intense recording project. And he, when he retired, he pulled the plug completely and. <laughs> I think he, I don't know if he misses it. I'd like to think, I keep hoping that, that maybe he and I will even not, not to record or anything, just to play together and, you know, a refresher. And, and what, do you have any thoughts on your future as a Shakuhachi player? All I, I want really is to be present in this community and to hopefully represent what my family's style has kind of evolved to become, you know, like over these generations that, that I can give that a voice, you know, in, in this modern era, you know, which is getting harder and harder <laughs> with, I'm not very good at, at making YouTube videos and, you know, all that stuff. So we'll see, but that, that's my, my goal is to just be present, to be available to people who are curious about our style of playing really it's the it's mostly to me it's about the music than notoriety or anything like that i which i know that, that that's partly my dad's downfall as well he was never that motivated to be famous or in the limelight he he practiced constantly if he wasn't eating or sleeping, he was practicing. He never did anything else. He'd practice in the car. He'd practice watching baseball or sumo or anything. He was always practicing. And I don't have that kind of focus that he did, but um, he, yeah, he, he just never really put himself out there as, he didn't speak of himself or even of his, his father, his grandfather, you know, even it, reading his thesis, it's very interesting. He downplays a lot of things, you know, I would so. love to read his thesis. I'll send it to you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. That's a fascinating story. And, uh, well, thank you for sharing it with us. Anything else you would like to say to people? Um, no, I, 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 you know, watch the rest of Kiku's series because there's really great information and there's a lot of examples of not great information and all the really good history and all that stuff is in here. So <laughs> I'd say that's, <laughs> I mean, it, yeah. I think it's necessary, so I'm, I'm trying to give my part of it. But I mean, I must say, it was really, really interesting to hear. Oh, it's this kind of getting in where you know people like me normally don't get in. So that was yeah. really great. <laughs> my pleasure. Thank you.